Hello, in this video, I'll be showing you how I made these stereographic projection homeomorphism animations in Blender with the help of Python. In technical Blender terms, for the punctured sphere, this will be a mesh vertex transformation, and for these slit circles and circles, they're curved control point transformations. Okay, so here we are in Blender. Let's delete the default cube. Let's go into scripting. I'm going to press new and control F so I can increase the font size over here to 20 for you all. And now let's add a mesh UV sphere. Okay, so I'll keep it at the default resolution. And now since we're scripting in Blender, let's import BPY. And then now let's access our sphere by writing out sphere equals BPY.data.objects index string sphere with capital S. Okay, so in order to morph our sphere, we're going to need to access the vertices of our sphere because they are what we'll be plugging into the stereographic projection function. So to do something to each vertex, a good way to do that would be to loop through the vertices. So we'll say for V inverts. So the general pseudocode is that for each vertex, we'll keyframe its initial coordinates, we'll then update the coordinates, and then we'll keyframe the final coordinates of the vertex for each vertex. To keyframe a vertex, we'll use v.keyframe underscore insert, and the data path is co for coordinates, and our initial frame of this transformation will be frame one. This behaves similar to keyframing an object's location when you use data path location. It's like keyframing the location of a vertex. And let's next keyframe the final frame of this transformation for each vertex and run the script. So if we go into layout, you'll see that we have this orange bar from frame 1 through 120. So if we play our animation, nothing happens because we never updated the vertex coordinates, so our mesh isn't going to deform. Okay, I'll delete these keyframes and go back into scripting. Now let's update our coordinates. And actually, before I'm going to update the coordinates, I like to extract the Cartesian coordinates of the vertex. So we can extract the x, y, and z coordinates of v.co into variables x, y, z all in one line. v.co is of class type vector and it contains three floats which we're extracting into these three variables. Another way to access these coordinates is v.co.x, v.co.y, and v.co.z. And .x.y.z is the same as index 0, 1, and 2. Alright, and now we'll set the new v.co equal to these Cartesian coordinates plugged into the stereographic projection function. So this is the output of stereographic projection. The new x coordinate is x over 1 minus c, the new y coordinate is y over 1 minus c, and the new z coordinate is 0. Okay, so this script looks good, but I know it's not going to work because when we run it, we run into a float division by 0 error. So we projected some of the vertices, but once it reached the North Pole, it ran into division by zero errors because when you're at the North Pole, z is 1, so you have x over 1 minus 1, which is x over 0, and you'd also have y over 0, which is division by 0. Okay, so I'm going to control z. Let's go ahead and click on our sphere, press tab to go into edit mode, click on the North Pole, press delete on your keyboard, and then select vertices, then press tab again. So we now have a punctured sphere and our script should work. Yes, it did. So here is a stereographic projection homeomorphism. Very nice. I personally think this transformation looks better when viewed from this upside down angle because it sort of does this melting effect. So next, I'm gonna show you how to do it from a slit circle to a line. I'm going to hide our sphere, then I'm going to go into scripting, and let's create a new text file. I'm going to name our previous file punk sphere morph, and I'll name the new file slit circle morph. Alright, so we'll start off by copying the previous algorithm into this new text file. This time, let's add a mesh circle to our scene, and then press numpad 7, press tab to go into edit mode, click on the north pole, keyboard delete, then select vertices. Tab, right click your mesh, and then convert it to a curve. Next, go into the object data properties down here, go into geometry, bevel, round, give it depth, and then I like to fill in the caps. Now, we don't want to access our sphere, we want to access our circle. So, our circle is this time a curve and not a mesh, so we'll say points equals circle.data.splines index 0 dot points. I'll change our for loop to for p and points. We'll now keyframe p, extract the Cartesian coordinates from p, update p, and keyframe the final p coordinates. So this time we're going to use the stereographic projection that maps a slit circle in the xy plane to a flat line at height y equals 0. So the new y will be 0 and the new x will be x over 1 minus y. Now everything about about this looks good except for one thing it's that 
p.co's contain four floats. So if you want to extract everything from p all in one line, we're going to have to add in a fourth variable. Let's call it w because it's the weight of this point. We're not going to be working with the weights of the spline points in this video. Also, when we update p.co, we have to throw in a fourth float. So I'll set it equal to zero. Okay, so now this looks good. Let's run our script and bam, we have a stereographic projection from a slit circle to the x-axis. All right, so z and w are dummy variables for this, so this may be a more appropriate time to only extract the x and y coordinates from p.co. Likewise, this may be a more appropriate time to only update the x and y coordinates. So if you run the script, it does the same exact thing. So now if you look at the following animation, you might want to learn how to automate this generation of these slit circles and automate the projection of them. We'll be changing how we access our circles, so I'm going to delete this and let's actually triple quote the rest of this so I can show you what we're doing incrementally as I show you how to automate this projection. So I'm going to go ahead and delete our circle and let's first add a mesh primitive circle. If we only run this line, we simply get a circle in our scene. Now when we use add, the freshly added object to the scene will always be the active object. And you can also write dot object if you want. Now we're adding a circle mesh and we want to delete its north pole. So we need to access the vertices of our mesh with circle.data.vertices. Now when we run the script, nothing new should happen, but I want to point out when we go into edit mode, we can see that everything of our mesh is selected. We only want the north pole to be selected because that's what we'll be deleting. So I'm first going to deselect everything after we add the mesh circle. So we go into edit mode, we deselect everything, and then we go back into object mode. Now when we run our script, as you can see, go into edit mode, nothing is selected this time. When we go back into object mode in our script, we can then select the north pole, which is the zeroth index vert of all of our vertices. Okay, so let's run our script, and now as you can see, edit mode, only the north pole is selected. In edit preferences, you can enable developer extras and actually show these indices of the vertices. They're really tiny, but the north pole is zero, and if you go this direction, one, two, three, four, etc, etc. So now that we have the north pole selected, we can delete it by going into edit mode, then deleting all of the vertices that are selected with this line, and then we'll go back into object mode. So let's run the script, and bam, we have a slit circle mesh. The next step would then be to convert our mesh to a curve and then give it some properties. So this line converts it to a curve and here we're setting its bevel revolution. I gave it some depth, smoothed it out a bit, and then I fill in the caps. And up here when we add our mesh primitive circle, you might want to give it a few more vertices. So now when we run the script, as you can see, we get a nice looking slit circle curve. And so if we go ahead and delete this and then untriple quote out the rest of this algorithm, when we run our script, we get the automation of the stereographic projection of our slit circle. Okay, so if you put all of this inside of, for example, a for loop, if we run the script, we get 10 all at once, and these are all the same projection. And it may be good to store all of these circles in a collection. So we can create a new collection, call it circles, with this line. We can then access our scene collection, which is this over here. We'll link the new collection to our scene collection, and then inside the for loop, we'll link each circle to the new collection and unlink that circle from the scene collection. So if our scene collection is the active collection by clicking on it, we can run the script and then we'll get a new collection full of circles. Okay, so for the two transformations that I've shown you so far, we only use two keyframes. We keyframe the initial coordinates and we keyframe the final coordinates. Some people might do a linear interpolation frame by frame when you can literally right click both the keyframes in the timeline and let Blender do the linear interpolation for you. Practice using the least amount of keyframes as possible. But if you ever do run into a situation where you need to keyframe a transformation frame by frame, I'm gonna show you how you can go about thinking about that for this transformation. Okay, so we're going to access our sphere, get its vertices, and loop through the vertices the same way as previously. This time I'm going to add the initial frame of this transformation and the delta frames of this transformation, which I'm calling frames. First what we'll do is set v.co equal to p. We can then extract the x, y, and z coordinates from p. We'll then set q equal to the output of p. Okay, so p is a point on a sphere and q is that point's corresponding point in the plane. 
for each vertex of our sphere mesh, we want to keyframe it for each frame of this transformation. Therefore, let's add a for loop in the range of frames for i in range frames. And for each frame, we'll be adding one keyframe at frame frame i plus i. So when i is 0, your frame is 1. When i is 1, your frame is 2. When i is 2, your frame is 3, and so forth. And so the general concept behind of how we're going to essentially hard code this linear interpolation is that we need to update the v.co and set it equal to p plus some number that starts at 0 and then ends at 1 as we iterate through this inner for loop and then multiply this 0 through 1 number times the displacement vector q minus p. So when this number is 0, you have p plus 0 times q minus p, which is p plus 0, which is p. So when this is 0, we're at p. And then when this is 1, we're at p plus 1 times q minus p, which is all equal to q. Okay, so in this line, we're actually doing vector math. p is a vector, and we're doing vector math with q and p, but we never converted q to a vector. v.co is of class type vector, and if you want to do vector math between p and q, we need to also make sure that q is a vector. So let's cast it to a vector. And we'll be getting vector from math utils. So from math utils, let's import vector. Okay, so this number that starts at 0 and ends at 1 as we iterate through this inner for loop is i over frames minus 1. Think about it. When i is 0, you have 0 over frames minus 1, which is 0. And then i ends at frames minus 1. So when i is frames minus 1, we have frames minus 1 over itself, which is 1. And lastly, there's one last thing that we need to change about this script. We're setting p equal to v.co. So right here, when we update v.co, we're saying v.co equals an updated version of v.co for each iteration through this inner for loop. So setting v.co equal to an updated version of itself each iteration will actually speed up the transformation, and we don't want that. So if we say p equals v.co.copy, when we refer back to p, it will always be the original point on the sphere that we refer back to. And that's just what we need. So let's run the script and it might take a little longer because there are more keyframes, but now as you can see, we sort of hard coded the linear interpolation of this transformation frame by frame. So this is the easiest way to think about this linear interpolation frame by frame in my opinion, but I'm going to show you another way how to do it. And then I'm going to show you how to reparameterize this transformation frame by frame. Okay, so we'll only need to extract x, y, and z from v.co. We don't need p and q. And then when we update our v.co, we're going to set it equal to the parametric version of the stereographic projection function of a punctured unit sphere to an x, y plane at height z equals zero. If you want to understand the parametric version of these types of functions, I'd recommend watching my stereographic projection function derivation tutorial using line parameterizations on my channel. So parametric equations have this parametric variable which is usually named t, and t behaves like a slider for the beginning and endpoints of the transformation. Okay, so we're going to need to get t, and t starts from 1 and ends at 1 over 1 minus c for this parametric equation when transforming our punctured sphere to a flat plane. So the general linear interpolation from some t initial to t final would go like this. You set t equal to t initial plus the 0 through 1 variable times your delta t. Thus, we end up with this expression because our t initial is 1 and our t final is 1 over 1 minus c. E. And our 0 through 1 number is, remember, i over frames minus 1. We can then reduce this t expression into this right here. Now, when we run the script, it should produce the same animation as previously shown, frame by frame, hard-coded linear interpolation. Now I'm going to show you maybe one of the potential benefits of keyframing this transformation frame by frame. Okay, so t starts at 1 and then ends at 1 over 1 minus e for this parametric transformation. So there are other ways to grow t from 1 to 1 over 1 minus e. What if we set t equal to 1 over 1 minus z times i over frames minus 1? We're essentially attaching i over frames minus 1 to z. Okay, so when i is 0, you have 1 over 1 minus z times 0, which is 1 over 1, so t would be 1 when i is 0. And then when i is frames minus 1, you have 1 over 1 minus z, which is exactly what our parameterization variable needs to end at. So this is just another way to grow t from 1 to 1 over 1 minus z. So we should expect our punctured sphere to morph in a different way. Let's see what happens when we run the script. Okay, now when we go to layout, Look what happens. Our punctured sphere 
sort of turns into this punctured ellipsoid as it morphs into a flat plane. Wow, very cool. Here's what it looks like from the upside down angle. We have a sphere. It's like you're squishing the top of it and the rest of it unravels. Very nice. So that's all I wanted to show you for this Python tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned something new. Like, comment, subscribe, do all that. And thank you for watching. Bye.